Welcome everyone to our interview with Mr. Rüdiger von Kleist, who is the Executive Director for Germany to the International Monetary Fund. Thank you very much, Mr. von Kleist, for making the time today in your agenda to talk to us. Our interview will focus on the steps the IMF has taken so far and plans to take in the future to address the challenges countries are facing as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as on the economic forecast for the United States and Germany. Let me start with a brief introduction before we get to uh, before we get started on our questions. Mr. von Kleist is the executive director for Germany at the International Monetary Fund since September last year. He comes from the German Federal Ministry of Finance, where he held various positions as head of different units. He knows Washington and its multilateral institutions quite well. If I counted correctly, it is your fourth time in DC. From 2007 to 2011, you've been the alternate executive director for Germany at the World Bank. Before that, from 2000 to 2003, the alternate executive director for Germany at the IMF. And from 1993 to 1906, the senior advisor in Germany's ED office at the IMF. Mr. von Kleist holds a PhD in economics from the University of Freiburg. My name is Christoph Remjonek. I'm the Senior Director for Regional Economic Policy and World Bank Liaison at RGIT, that stands for the Representative of German Industry and Trade. We are based here in Washington, D.C. And at RGIT, we aim to deepen U.S., German and transatlantic economic integration on behalf of our two principles, the Federation of German Industries, BDI, and the Association of German Chambers of Industry and Commerce, DIHK. A large part of our work aims to highlight the positive contribution of German companies to the US economy. Just a few examples, according to the German Bundesbank, there are around 5,400 German companies in the United States. And the US Bureau of Economic Analysis shows that foreign direct investment from Germany to the US stands at 474 billion US dollars and that German affiliates employ more than 770,000 people. So as one can see, the US, and Germany, the US and Germany's economies are highly interlinked and they are also highly interlinked with global markets. And this brings me already to our questions. <clears throat> but before that, I would like to ask Mr. von Kleis um, to introduce himself briefly and explain a little bit more to our audience what the role of the Executive Director's Office of Germany to the IMF is, uh, what it is actually. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that kind introduction. On the first question, I can actually be quite brief. It's just important to understand that the uh, International Monetary Fund is owned by shareholders. These shareholders are its 189 member countries, and these 189 member countries uh, are represented on the board of the IMF. And uh, there are larger member countries like the US or China, uh, or even uh, or also Germany uh, uh, in this context, uh, which have sort of their own executive director. So I represent Germany as owner of the fund at, on the executive board. And then there are smaller countries where, where sort of several countries uh, share, share uh, an executive director. And so all in all, we have 24 of them. And um, our role is basically uh, to make sure that the fund does what its membership needs. And in that context, specifically, each and every uh, financial support program which uh, the fund uh, offers to its members has to be approved by the executive board. So that's in a nutshell uh, what we do. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And um, yeah, one of my first questions would be, so I mentioned that the uh, US and Germany, both economies are highly interlinked and they are also very highly interlinked with the global markets and of course that's why we look uh, closely what is going on in the global economy and uh, reading the latest IMF's world economic outlook it projects there that global growth in 2020 will fall to minus three percent so my question would be Mr. von Kleist what steps has the IMF taken so far to soften the impact to the global economy and what other options if needed does the IMF have in its toolbox for the next month and year 
Well, um, on that question, and I'll come back to the numbers in a minute, just uh, sort of what, what does the IMF do? We have basically three legs we're standing on. The one leg, and from our point of view, the most important one is what we call surveillance. Uh, that is uh, regular annual consultations with member countries, where member countries explain their uh, economic policies and, and what they are doing and how they to banking regulations and whatever uh, else there may be, uh, they explain that to the fund staff and the fund staff writes a report about that and that report is then uh, being published and yeah. discussed in the executive board uh, in a so-called peer review process, so that's surveillance. And then we have our lending operations. If countries uh, should uh, experience a uh, balance of payment need in the sense that they run uh, uh, short of foreign reserves, which you know would in the extreme case lead to import compression, meaning that countries couldn't import necessary things like medication or spare parts for machinery or something like that, then the IMF stands ready to also help with money. That money is granted upon, it's not, it's, it's, uh, they are loans and these loans are given, uh, so they have to be paid back and they are also, there's conditionality attached to that, which means that uh, the fund discusses with the members why, how they can sort of avoid running into future balance of payments needs so so that that sort of the policies improve that's that's a very important conditionality attached to the loans and the third leg we're standing on is what we call uh, technical assistance or capacity development where we help those members who are uh, short on on administrative capacity those are especially very poor countries but also you know in some instances middle income countries you know let's say on central banking law on or on other issues where we can help them with experts uh, uh, the how to to manage uh, their, their economies uh, better. One important example would be, for instance, uh, in the climate change uh, discussion, the IMF has looked very closely at what countries around the world are doing to combat climate change and how to, you know, the most efficient way uh, to to deal with with high carbon emissions. And now, you know, he's he's in a position to advise member countries on what the best uh, sort of solutions to that problem is, which is a global, it's a global uh, uh, issue. It's a global. Uh, uh, Thing that the global challenge, and so it makes a lot of sense that a global uh, institution like the IMF um, uh, takes care of this and, and can advise it, its members. So that's 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 what the IMF does. Now, for the bigger member countries mm -hmm. uh, like the US or Germany, we would usually not provide financing, but uh, obviously the surveillance part uh, is very important part so we receive a mission from the imf every year in germany and have very long and intensive discussions with them and actually also with the i for instance in germany so and with the private sector they can speak to everyone they want to speak to they speak to rating agencies in germany i speak to private banks they speak to us of course to so the bundesbank uh, and so mm -hmm. and so in the future so what else uh, so you think these three legs you just described uh, they are they are um, enough to to combat so to say the uh, the crisis we are seeing right now well this crisis is unprecedented and um so in that sense the IMF has during the previous spring meetings which are just 3 weeks you know just 3 weeks ago has decided upon a number of measures uh, which will help us to cope better with this crisis. Uh, we have, with mm. a certain amount of foresight, made sure that the IMF has enough money. That's you know very important. Yeah. So we have this this number, which some people may have heard in the in the news, uh, that is you know one trillion dollars available. You know, very roughly yeah. speaking, uh, for lending, and and that is a lot of money, but that is available to be able to help countries with balance of payments. We have, on top of that, decided to uh, double a, a so-called emergency assistance uh, program we have where countries who are faced by the COVID pandemic can, with very little uh, conditionality and a very sort of very streamlined formal process, get quick help to help mm -hmm. them deal with the immediate effects of the pandemic, for instance, uh, importing uh, important medical supplies or uh, paying doctors or nurses better or whatever they feel is necessary or you know adding new beds to to hospital intensive care units you know there are a lot of things one one 
can and must do. Mm. And so this emergency financing uh, uh, was doubled, which is available to countries. Uh, another thing we did, we created a new uh, liquidity line, which is more for middle income countries, which uh, feel they have enough reserves at the moment. They don't have an immediate balance of payments need, but they just would like a sort of insurance. And so we created a liquidity line now during the spring meetings, uh, which means countries can uh, call upon this liquidity line uh, without any prior approval of a program or something. You know, if they have good economic policies in the past, they qualify for the liquidity line, and once they qualify for the liquidity line, they can call upon it if, if they should need it, if the pandemic turns out to be worse. Uh, mm -hmm. We are also increasing the resources available for the poorest member countries. The poorest member countries obviously mm -hmm. are the hardest hit, and uh, so uh, the IMF has started a, a, a call for member countries to supply resources to be, you know, which we can then uh, lend forward to these poorest countries. We have also started with a uh, reduction the uh, uh, debt burden of the poorest countries where basically donors like Germany or Japan or other big countries uh, take over debt payments for poor countries which they would otherwise owe to the fund so that that would free resources in those countries to uh, to, to be able to deal with the with the pandemic um, so this is uh, this is all in all a package which has made a tremendous amount of resources available to member countries uh, we have 102 countries of 189 who have already uh, approached the fund for support. So the fund is working flat out to help its member countries. Uh, but of course, at the same time, as I mentioned, the other two legs, surveillance and uh, helping with capacity development go on as well, which is, you know, especially, you know, it's all a bit more difficult nowadays with mm. Working from home and not being able to travel and so forth, but luckily, you know, the internet has been around for a couple of years, so basically, we can reach every corner of the world. So far, and the internet seems to be stable. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Von Kleist. And um, so we we all uh, are aware and observe that the current pandemic is uh, very global. However, regional and national economies will see different impacts, and we talked a little bit about this already. Our office here uh, supports companies on both sides of the Atlantic, and um, therefore our audience would be interested in hearing a bit more about your forecast for the German and the US economies. Could you give us a brief overview? Well, at the moment, um, because this pandemic and the way it's being dealt with is unprecedented. Mm. So there are no really good models to fall back onto. And therefore, I will refrain from quoting long rows of numbers of what the growth expectations might mm -hmm. be this year or next year. I think the important issue which, which people are now focusing on is I think we will, everybody will experience a downturn in GDP, basically everybody. I mean, mm. there are very, very few countries where, where that might not be the case, countries who are not integrated to the global economy, but I mean, the US and, and Germany, quite obviously, to take those two, we will experience a strong downturn in mm -hmm. GDP, at least in the, in, the, in the second quarter, maybe still in the third quarter. And then the question, and this is really the question everybody focuses on, what will happen after this downturn? And that's where these uh, these these uh, buzzwords come in. Will we experience a V-shaped recovery, which means we have a very strong downward movement mm -hmm. now, and then a swift upward movement again? And that's at the moment the current thinking that that is what we will what we will experience both in the U.S. and uh, in Germany. And and that is sort of where what policymakers. And, and the response policymakers are implementing is geared towards that, that we cannot avoid the, the negative impacts of the lockdown, but at the same time, the lockdown is absolutely medically necessary. There is you know, no dissent on that. And uh, so uh, we do everything to make sure that after the strong uh, uh, reduction in growth, we, we get a quick, a quick uh, uh, recovery. But of course, we don't know what will happen. We don't know whether there will be a second or third wave. We don't know whether there will be uh, any medication available, uh, whether, the, uh, you know, so, so uh, the question is, you know, could we not 
could we face not maybe a v-shaped recovery but a u-shaped recovery where you know we stay at the bottom a bit longer and then we go up that's still a comparatively benign scenario the worst scenario would of course be an l-shaped you know where we have a very strong reduction in growth and then you know for whatever reasons the economy stays flat afterwards and, and there are models which you know they are not totally a sort of uh, irrelevant which which uh, which say this could happen in a worst case scenario so that's really what we're looking at we're looking at a global slowdown uh, that's sort of the drawback of the of the globalized economy we've, we've experienced where we experienced the benefits wow. of during the past 20 years this is sort of the drawback that basically everybody is in, is is integrated in the world economy, uh, even you know small Pacific islands. You know they depend on tourism, or, or some many have other exports, but you know many are very strongly dependent on tourism, and tourism is a part of mm -hmm. globalization because you know nowadays many more people travel than used to. You know because a lot of emerging markets uh, have 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 uh, 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 middle income earners who also like to travel like you know the us and and and, and europe have always liked to travel so in that uh, context everybody's being hit mm. and um the question is you know how quickly will the rebound be and and you know on the policy measures i think the approach on both sides of the atlantic is broadly similar saying we need to protect people and we need to protect companies and i think if you look at the measures that were agreed to both in the us and and in uh, in in germany you know i'll take the german example first the so called kurzarbeitergeld the the uh, short working hours uh, uh, subsidy basically means that companies do not have to lay off workers but they get generous government support of course they have to chip on some of their own money to be able to keep their workers because obviously looking forward in an aging society like germany uh, you know, having a well qualified and well stocked uh, workforce is going to be essential looking forward. You know, if you want to be competitive in the world economy once the upswing has, has, has started. So, in the US, for instance, they've chosen a different approach, you know, because the social safety net in general is not as well established as it is in Germany, for instance. You know, they have uh, done these direct mailings of income support to citizens uh, where sort of simply everybody gets a check in the mail and uh, uh you know you have money to spend even even if you have have lost your job so so in the end it's about protecting people and it's a, about protecting uh, uh, uh companies that as soon as the pandemic is over as soon as the lockdown can be lifted as soon as people can go back to work and everybody wants to go back to work oh. really uh, uh, mm. So that they are able to do that, that their company still exists, and that people have, you know, some means to 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 uh, feed their families and pay for the roof over their heads. So that's very. The approach is very similar. The details are very different because obviously the social systems, um, you know, both regarding health insurance or regarding uh, unemployment insurance and other things are very very different. But the objective. The objective is the same on both sides of the Atlantic. Make sure companies survive and make sure people survive. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned you mentioned uh, how global our economy became over the last 20 years. And uh, so this is also the success for Germany's economy and especially um, the success for German export-oriented companies who relies heavily on those open markets and uh, globally interconnected, very complex supply chains by now. But with the current global pandemic, we observe tendencies toward national standalone solutions. And um, this also includes a trend of localizing supply chains. And uh, my next question would be what the IMF as a multilateral institution can do to keep borders open, free trade going, and, the, uh, and eventually the global economy thriving. Well, first of all, the IMF is, is a very strong supporter of free trade. You know, even though it is not, you know, we have the World Trade Organization dealing specifically with trade issues, mm. but in, on, a, on a theoretical and on a sort of principles level, the IMF is, is a very strong support of free, free trade, including capital flows. So that's, that's, there's no question about that. And, and one of the ways we keep trade flowing is by providing balance of payment support, because that means countries who would otherwise not be able to import things they need mm -hmm. can still do so because we provide the balance of payments. 
so that that is very important on the on the other issue whether whether we will really have more localized supply chains and so forth i'm not so sure i think there will be maybe you know there will be somewhat more than there used to be in the past the discussion on what are strategic assets strategic mm -hmm. assets in the sense of let's say certain medications and there you can say, well, this is really not a trade issue, but that is a strategic issue, like we have oil reserves in Germany. You know, we have oil reserves. We have also have a certain stock of food reserves. Shouldn't we have the capability to produce certain medical supplies at home? And that has nothing to do with trade. That is a strategic question for Germany and of my sense it would be better for for the eu you know it doesn't make sense to look at these sense from a german point of view you know for the eu to decide we need to have certain capabilities to and that but not because we don't want to trade but because from a strategic sense this is a vulnerability which has been exposed on the supply chain i guess that my expectation as an economist would be that we get a little less of just-in-time delivery of spare parts and things like that and maybe companies will start rebuilding stocks of you know things they need to assemble the products they will will actually then try to sell so you know higher costs in the sense of yes we will have 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 uh, bigger bigger stocks uh, 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 at the same time uh, you know the the risk of running out of uh, 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 supply parts you need to, you know, finish your your eventual product. You know that risk is being reduced, so we may see some change in that, and uh, this will also maybe change. You know, especially with automated, with you know, factories and 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 and, uh, and companies which are highly automated. You know, the question is. You know how dependable is electricity supply how dependable is uh, the, the law framework all those things always play into this issue of where are we going to uh, produce are labor costs really the only variable which which are important or the other variables and i think this issue about disruption of global uh, value chains this issue of having strategic assets at home not because we don't want to trade but because we need them for 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 for, for safety reasons i think that will, will but it will not i i don't think it will change the picture as such in a very fundamental way and especially the high-end products i think german companies uh, uh, produce and and sell worldwide uh, especially the machine industry, but also cars and pharmaceuticals and all those other things, you know, will still be very important. And of course, German tourists, you know, that's also a very important part of our trade. You know, German tourists will want to travel the world again, you know, which is not an export, of course, but an import, for, uh, you know, from the balance of payments uh, view. But in that sense, I think that will also return. So, so I don't see this as a fundamental change to the setup of the global globalized economy it you know just makes too much sense you know it's it's basically adam smith revisited you know that mm -hmm. you know the vision of labor improves productivity and that's what globalization is all about but it doesn't mean that we have you know that we cannot in some instances companies and i think that will be the decision of companies to tweak that to make sure that, you know that sort of increase the resilience increase the safety margin uh, but not turn their backs on free trade. I, I don't really expect that. Okay, thank you. And um, we are coming to my last questions I have here. And uh, we talked already a little, little bit about the forecasts. And um, so we hear from companies from different sectors that they are very concerned about the current decrease in demand and the difficulties around their supply chains. But there are also voices that are cautiously optimistic about their business expectations for later this year and a possible rebound in in uh, the fourth quarter from an imf imf perspective what needs to be undertaken so that the economy can rebound in the second half of 2020 well, what can, the end, what, um, what's the optimistic what, what, outlook from, from the imf um i think the motto of of the imf is hope for the best but prepare for the worst and I think uh, what you hear from our point of view when we discuss do we have enough resources, you know, can we support our members, what will happen in the, in the worst case scenario. I think that that's all about trying to prepare for bad outcomes while still thinking that the baseline 
will be a good outcome, the V-shaped recovery, which, which I discussed a couple of minutes ago, and where sort of the policies that have been put in place by finance ministries, by central banks, by supervisors, by health ministries, by everyone, uh, that the uh, pandemic can be contained, at least to an extent that a largely normal, you know, even if people may still wear face masks and other stuff, but, you know, a, a largely normal life can be possible. But there are uncertainties connected to that. And that is the part where sort of the, the IMF stands ready to, to support its members longer and with more support than in what we still is our baseline scenario that we will have a strong return because we have pent up demand. People have not been buying cars. People have not been going to restaurants. People have not been shopping as much as they would normally have done. People have probably bought fewer mm -hmm. houses, all those things that is pent up demand. And uh, so we feel that that demand will show itself. And so we will have an upswing. For me, the most important question is really, I, I, I don't, I'm pretty sure that this will happen. For me, this, the, the, the most important point for policymakers is to use this upswing in a way which serves other purposes as well. And the most important in this context are two, actually. This one is climate change and the other one is digitalization. So companies will start, you know, they haven't invested very much and people haven't bought things. So now, and, and you know, uh, now is the opportunity to think about, okay, how can we achieve that we participate in this upswing, which is the baseline assumption of basically all policymakers, but at the same time ensure that whatever we do as a company from a microeconomic point of view and whatever we do as a country from a macroeconomic point of view that we are greener afterwards which means you know we achieve our climate goals and what can we do to ensure that the challenges of digitalization which will continue and they're not only challenges sorry one should also call them opportunities you know yeah. the, the opportunities of, of digitalization is probably the much better word uh, uh, that the opportunities of digitalization are being taken you know at the same time so i think that is really that is really the, the most important question but otherwise uh, the, the 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 assumption that we will have a v-shaped recovery is at the moment still universally shared uh, uh, but again you know there is a high margin of uncertainty mm -hmm. and and uh, so uh, uh, that's why we continue to say okay we are prepared to act if necessary to support yeah. the membership but i think what countries are doing and what the imf has been doing now with the emergency finance and everything um, is sufficient and, and 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 the world should be a again a much better place in six months great thank you so much and i take this as a very optimistic note from your side i want to thank you very much for the time you took to talk to us today sharing your insights and perspectives, very interesting and very helpful also uh, to hear that um, perspective from the IMF to our and our audience will um, will be happy to hear that. And uh, we put up this um, video shortly and uh, we, again, thank you so much for your time. It was my pleasure. Thank you very much uh, for contacting me. And uh, my last comment will be, please everyone stay healthy and stay safe. <laughs> you too. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.